Good morning and welcome to the Morning Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cam, coming to you as always from the Spotlight Studios here in Morristown, New Jersey. My guest today is a cost segregation expert, helping hundreds of real estate investors save tens of millions of dollars in income taxes. He is the host of Weiss Advice and speaks to some of the best minds in real estate, business, and beyond to learn how anyone can succeed in life. He's been a guest on over 100 of the top real estate podcasts to discuss these subjects and is now here on the Morning Spotlight. He is Yona Weiss. Yona, welcome. I am so pleased to be here, Michael. It is, it's awesome speaking with you all the time and uh, glad to just be joining you on the Morning Spotlight. No, I'm, I'm pumped. I'm excited. Um, I guessed it on the Weiss Advice podcast, which I didn't mention in the bio that that is a podcast. I just said Weiss Advice. So maybe people, if they don't know what that is, it's a podcast. Um, so Yona is a podcaster. I've seen a lot of his stuff on LinkedIn. We connected because I just liked a lot of the stuff that he was doing. I came on uh, your show uh, as a guest, which has not yet aired. Um, it not is still either. in the, uh, in the uh, stratosphere right now, but uh, it will be released eventually. So if you want more Mike and Yoda, you're going to be able to get it because we'll have this, we'll have that. It's going to be great. So um, tell me a little bit about, uh, let's just start with the cost segregation stuff because I think to be honest, and I'm not trying to make this sound mean or anything like that, that could be the most boring thing that we talk about over the course of this episode, but that's just me. Maybe you could make it sound exciting. I mean, I sell title insurance. That's boring, um, but uh, I try to make it as fun as possible. So tell us what exactly. cost segregation actually is. Yeah, the trick is to try to make boring things exciting, even right. if they are you know, categorically boring. Right? Um, the funny thing is about cost segregation, it's typically done uh, by engineers and accountants. It's a combination of those two people who happen to be usually the most boring people uh, around, which is why someone like me has to come around and explain it on a podcast so that it can actually be understood in a, in a simple way without getting into you know tax law and you know nitty gritty engineering stuff. I'll sum it up in about 90 seconds cool. and you'll tell me if it, if it still sounds like the most boring thing you've ever heard. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. All right. <laughs> okay. Essentially, real estate happens to be the most tax advantaged vehicle in the world. Okay. Especially in the United States, the tax code is extremely favorable to real estate investors, as we know from Donald Trump and, you know, not paying income tax and all that good stuff. The reason why is this cool deduction called depreciation. And it's based on the concept, you know, depreciation means something's going down in value uh, as time goes on. But what the government has done is allowed you to take a deduction, basically write off the entire value of any property you buy, okay, based on the purchase price from the day that you buy it, okay, even if it was built 100 years ago. What cost segregation does, it just like the name sounds a weird name, but basically segregates that cost into different categories that allows you to take faster depreciation deductions up front. So that means in simple terms, giving you big tax deductions, more cash flow in your pocket. That's it. That's what conservation is. It's a very kind of complicated way to reverse engineer your property to get faster, you know, big tax deductions in the early years of ownership. Gotcha. Okay. You had me at more cash flow, uh, more money in your pocket. So how does one get involved? Like, well, how did you, how do you get started in, in this subject? Like, how do, how do you get started in cost segregation? Is that something like a childhood dream? Like, yeah, you, know, you want to do I, that? You know, I always wanted to be a cost segregation expert when I grew up and uh, just happened to be. You yeah. Know? <laughs> it, it was between that and, uh, and uh, having an anteater farm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little inside joke for everybody listening. Uh, but we won't, we don't even have to get into that. But <laughs> um, all right. So, so you, how do you get, how, how do you actually get started in it? Yeah, so typically cost segregation companies are uh, accounting firms or specialized kind of third-party companies who are engineering and accounting you know, together that work with real estate owners mm -hmm. and investors, real estate companies across the country. So there's a lot of national companies. Madison Specs happens to be the biggest national company, even though we're based in New Jersey um, and we're part of kind of a larger group of companies, Madison Title, right? Obviously we do a lot of other things for commercial real estate, but the specs brand is specifically in cost segregation. So how does one get involved? Again, it's usually relegated to engineers and accountants, but there are people like me who are in the business development and, and other operational team members who make it so that, you know, it actually can be processed. Right. What were you doing before you started doing this? 
Um, before this, so let's go back, like rewind yeah. quite rewind. quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, I was a teacher for many years, and okay. so that's kind of my passion. Uh, I got involved in real estate about six years ago, and so that flip flop between a bunch of different things, just kind of learning the trade, yeah. really learning everything about it. So I did some fix and flips. I did uh, some commercial mortgage brokering, some hard money loans. Did a real little residential brokering. You know. Um, you know, sold some properties, did stuff like that, but nothing really, you know, piqued my passion because uh, my passion was really in teaching all, all the time. So right. real estate was really interesting and, and a great opportunity uh, to kind of a field, an industry that I knew I wanted to get involved in and wanted to kind of break into. And so I spent a few years really learning the ins and outs, commercial real estate and all that good stuff. And then this opportunity kind of just came my way with Madison. Mm -hmm. And I took it and it turned out to be really just like another teaching gig. Like, right. that's it. Right? I'm like, yeah. I'm just teaching people about this really complicated concept, simplifying it down and making it so that investors know how to get more money in their pocket. Right. So does this, um, does cost segregation work across any asset class or are there specific classes that you tend to focus on or Anything. It can be done on any asset class. And we work with every single asset class out there. The only type of property that this cannot be done in is your personal residence. So okay. if you own any investment or business property, commercial, residential, doesn't matter. You can do cost segregation on. And then does it matter where in the United States it is? Does not matter. Okay. Does not matter whatsoever. I mean, we work in all 50 states. Um, there are The one thing that would potentially matter is... Um, depreciation is this great deduction, like I said, and is based on your purchase price, but land is something that doesn't depreciate. So there's always going to be a land value that's, you know, associated with the property. And, and we understand that from property taxes, right? Property taxes are based on the land value versus the building value. Certain areas like California is very notorious for this or New York city where the land value is so high that what you're buying is almost all like land. Even the building could be expensive, but it's worth like peanuts compared to what the land is. And right. so therefore your depreciation basis, like how much you can actually take that depreciation is much uh, less. It's much limited. So that would be the only, you know, kind of limiting factor to where ge geographically it would make sense. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was just curious. Cause I didn't know like, you know, if different, if how property taxes work in different States and if that made a difference in how you would um, no. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, Cause we're working with federal income. Like that's, this is a ta income tax benefit. Yep. Um, not property tax related. Right. Okay, cool. All right. So, so we're talking, this is more, so what I think sometimes when I hear you talk about this kind of stuff, I think that's where maybe I miss it is like, it's more income tax related than it is actually property tax related. Um, and I think that's an important distinction to make, um, because like I said, I didn't, I right. didn't know that, you know what I mean? Exactly. Cause you hear like properties and tax and people don't make the connection between income tax. Um, because until you really learn the ins and outs of real estate and how beneficial this, this is for income tax, uh, you don't even make the connection. Right. Right. Uh, Cause your properties and tax, you, you know, put two and two right? property tax. Yeah. Right. <laughs> which but is a thing, which is something that, you know, you have to pay, but the income tax is really where the huge, huge benefits come in when investing in real estate. Right. Okay, great. All right. So cool. So now one of the things that you mentioned in some of those questions that I was answering or asking and you were answering um, is the fact that you've been only doing this for about six years, which I think is very impressive. Um, and I mentioned to this to you when we first met and when we when I came on your show is the fact that, you know, you have established yourself now as like the cost segregation guy. I don't see anybody else doing cost segregation stuff like this on LinkedIn or on podcasts or whatever. Um, so at what point, and I think I already know the answer to this, but my audience doesn't. So at what point did you decide like, Hey, I'm going to become like the thought leader on cost segregation. And what were the first couple steps that you did to do that? Well, I, it was just an observation that I made early on, you know, about three years ago or so when I first got involved with this, uh, especially you know, on LinkedIn, when I first, you know, kind of stepped into that space and saw that, like you said, there was almost no one else talking about this. And I'm very active on bigger pockets as well. And, and around that same time, I got involved and I saw, again, these topics were coming up. There was no expert out there that was coming to answer all these questions. And people had tons of questions. And every single person that I spoke to, you know, whether it was through sales calls or, you know, uh, outreach, whatever it was, in-person meeting and stuff like that, people have tons of questions because it's, 
it's kind of complicated subject. And I was just answering people's questions and saw this is a great platform. I mean, there's no one else out there doing this at scale, right? right? And I just kind of filled that gap. And the way that, that I was able to do that at such a, such a fast pace, I think, in my opinion, is through podcasting. Like yeah. that was um, a huge, huge tool to kind of get me out there that with the combination of social media and kind of one feeds off the other, as you know, right? right? You have a podcast, you have content, right? Yeah. If you're a guest on other people's podcasts, you have content, right? It's, it's really simple. Like I'll just take a screenshot right now of the two of us here yeah. and, uh, and I'll, you know, go ahead and post this on LinkedIn. I have a great piece of content. Hey, me and Mike just had this great conversation. And this is a few things we talked about. If you want to be, you know, uh, hear the full episode when it releases, you know, let me know. And that's just, that's kind of, so putting yourself out there over and over and over again, establishing, your, establishing yourself as an expert in the space. LinkedIn is the best space out there to do that. Right. I agree. Um, especially with like the audience that generally you and I are trying to attract to our respective businesses, that's where they are. Um, and that's one of the things I think that maybe is important to, uh, like talk about because, you know, since I've been involved in clubhouse and doing some different things like that, I've seen other social media platforms of mine grow, like in particular my Instagram grow. And mm -hmm. I know you're on Instagram. We follow each other on Instagram and I see your stuff and I like it all the time, you know, just so you know. And, um, <laughs> But one of the things that I think I'm trying to balance is the idea that, I mean, granted, my show is not specifically real estate. We are probably 50-50 split between real estate and other cool stuff. Um, right. So I think I need to almost kind of sometimes split my time between those two platforms, which I think kind of spreads me a little bit thin. So in, you know, maybe uh, from your perspective, what do you think about doing stuff on, on those other platforms? Is it beneficial to you? Do you see a benefit or are you so focused on LinkedIn that the other stuff, do you just kind of like put stuff on there just to be there? I haven't seen as great of an impact through the other platforms as I have through LinkedIn. And part of that, part of the reason why is because there's still such an incredible organic growth, right. um, you know, reach through LinkedIn that you can get. And, uh, you know, on top of that, you get a lot more, I think, just in my experience, a lot more personal connections with people through that. And you can create conversations. It's, that's just been my experience. Yeah. It may be true on other platforms as well. And I, I certainly um, have seen others succeed extremely well on other yeah. platforms. So it, right. I think what it comes down to is using each platform um, to the extent that you're going to get you know, reap the benefits of that, you know, that's how much you should be putting time into it. So it's really kind of proportional. It's not that I'm uh, against any social media. <laughs> yeah. I think they're all great. Yeah. But, you know, you have to really focus on one to kind of build that brand and it will spill over to, right. to the others. Yeah, I, absolutely. I definitely agree with that. So let's talk a little, a little bit about the podcast. Um, well, we're going to talk a lot about the podcast, honestly. So uh, when did it start? I think you said three years ago. Or did I get that so, wrong? So my, yeah, no, my podcast is, is still a baby. It's still less than a year old. Oh, okay. I thought it was, why did I think it was older than that? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> great, great host. We started, <laughs> yeah. We started last, uh, officially launched uh, last June of 2020. It was, it was a little bit in the works beforehand. And the reason why I started it was kind of a combination of two things. One is that pr prior to starting it, I had already been a guest on over a hundred podcasts and I loved that you know, the conversation, right? Yeah. The, the relationship. But I also like asking questions and getting to know people. And I found the huge benefit of podcasting from the, you know, from the guesting perspective, I, you know, found huge benefit from doing that. Yeah. I thought, you, you know, just combining that and also giving back a little bit when you have your own podcast, you can give back, which means, you know, in, in two ways, one way you can invite some of those hosts that you thought were great conversationalists to your podcast. Not right. every host is. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> I've been guests on many podcasts that, you know, it's just, it was kind of painful. You know, you see the guy kind of reading a script and that's not my form of, of podcasting. I don't think it really goes so well. And you get the feel from that. I think uh, the listeners do. And I enjoy the, I just more enjoy the, the conversations we're having. And if I can add value and I could bring out that value from other guests, then I can share that with my audience as well. 
Yeah. And you know why I think I thought, I thought there was an older podcast is because you recently, I saw hit a hundred episodes and you've obviously blown by that since then. Um, so how many episodes have you posted today's April 6th, 2021? So how many episodes have you posted to date? So today I po- I ep- launched uh, episode 111. Wow. So 111. Uh, the reason why I was able to do that in under a year, obviously I'm releasing a lot of episodes, uh, two or three a week. Yeah. And that's kind of been the that's kind of been the MO for, for quite a while. I started off kind of one a week and I saw that I had so much, I just, I I got really happy when I started it, just like overly excited about doing it that I just ended up recording like 40 or 50 episodes. (laughs) Like right out of the gate. Yeah. Like within the first like (laughs) month. And I was like, I got all these, I loved it. And I really was, I was debating like just releasing, you know, daily. Yeah. And to me, that was just overload. Right. of content and so i tried out two that was good three is good so I'm kind of balancing between two and three right yeah when i started the morning spotlight i think i mentioned this to you the last time we talked I, it was every day monday through well monday through friday right. um and they were only five minutes long about uh but that for 12 doing that for three months so 12 weeks 60 episodes that was just like i was like i, I this is too much and that's why i kind of scaled it back on the episodes posting per week and then increased the in-depthness of the conversations. And we're actually having a conversation, not actually like reading stuff off of any particular right. script. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the great thing about, I mean, in order to really do that and do it successfully, you really have to have a team kind of managing uh, that. I, I don't know how someone can have a daily podcast with, without having a team managing no. it. I mean, I don't have a daily podcast and I don't have a team and it's hard to manage sometimes, <laughs> but, um, but two episodes a week, you know, 45 ish minutes for an episode. I mean, it's doable. Um, it takes up time for sure because you gotta, you know, do some edits and then all that kind of stuff, but you know, it's, it's a lot to do. So let's talk about the kind of guests that you have on. So if you have, if you do 111 episodes are all 111 people real estate focused, or do you do other types of things as well? I'd say the common de- denominator between 90% of my guests have been real estate and in many different areas. I mean, we have people who are multifamily investors and there's a lot of those because it's just kind of the, the people that I, my clients and I brought in, I'd say also a huge amount of the people that have, or have been guests have been my clients. It's just for yeah. a way, another way for me to kind of give back to them right. and, 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 you know, it, make that relationship grow in, in another way through having that conversation, adding value to them, et cetera. But, um, you know, self-storage, mobile home parks, we cover really any area of real estate, which is a lot of fun. It's something I enjoy. And I think my audience are all real estate investors yeah. in, in some regard or another. So that's really why it's focused on it. Although I have had a few people who are totally not related to real estate. Um, it's kind of random. I mean, one person was just, was a, uh, a sales guru, like a, a big guy in written books on sales. Yeah. And that was a great fun conversation. I think that applies to everything sales. So that was, that was a really good episode. Uh, but yeah, mostly real estate, even though the, it's funny because the podcast itself is not really about real estate. I wouldn't call right. it a real estate podcast, but I think real estate is a great common denominator because the majority of people who are real estate investors, I think, aren't solely in real estate. Meaning a lot of people make money in other things and then yeah. put that money to work in real estate. And so it's really just getting to know people and, right. and people in real estate. Are. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. And I think that's such a great way to kind of look at it. And I know like when I came on your show, like you said, I mean, I know we talked a little bit about title insurance, but a lot of it was learning about me and kind of my story. And that's what I think is interesting because I do think you know, when you're, when you have an audience, you know, which I, I would think that our audiences are somewhat similar, maybe some overlap, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, but um, I think that like they connect more with people in this, like if they're, let's just say they're like 25 years old, and they're trying to get involved in real estate in some capacity, whether they want to invest or go work for some company in real estate or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it's good to hear stories like ours, teacher, college baseball coach, we didn't come from an area that was like focused in real estate, but now here we are in real estate, top of our field, um, you know, crushing life and the podcast game and business and all that kind of stuff. But it just makes you more human and it makes uh, it easier to connect with those people. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, All right. So what do you think? uh, um, 
I just literally just lost my train of thought. I had a great question all teed up, ready to go. Um, so take us through like, how do you, uh, last year, this is not the question I had and hopefully it comes back to me again, <laughs> such a pro. Um, but, uh, last year, obviously there was a lot of stuff going on. Uh, not sure if you knew about that, but, um, you know, so everything is closed and everybody starts doing more stuff online. Um, so you, I had obviously already established yourself online, yeah. but then you had this huge influx of people, you know, like me, honestly, that were now posting stuff online about, you know, whether they were starting a podcast or they were starting stuff in real estate. Um, so in what ways do you think your stuff is still able to kind of cut through all this new noise? Was it because it was already established or do you think you do something a little bit better than everybody else? <laughs> <clears throat> it's a great question. I think th- you know, to be honest, just, I don't know that I'm cutting through the noise. There's a lot of noise and there's a lot more people that have seen the benefit of social media. And obviously because they couldn't go to, you know, meetups, conferences, people put a lot more time and energy into social media and into online branding. Um, So there is a lot more of that. Uh, I think the way that you really can cut through and and perhaps this is how I've, um, you know, excelled in, in what I've done to the extent that I have is that it's more about creating a community than anything else. And I, you know, I did that. I started a Facebook group. It's a small one and it's kind of just there in real estate connections. And it's just about connecting people and things like that. And I do, I started a meetup where we'll have, you know, online once a week zoom meetup. So we're just kind of getting to know people more and more on the online realm. And so creating those relationships and just strengthening those relationships. That's what's going to uh, kind of cut through that, that noise, as you put it, because you can only consume so much content that's out there. And the more people that are putting out content, the harder it is to, to kind of maintain those relationships because you're, you're competing, right? You can only contain so much, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, the other thing that I was going to ask is when uh, pre COVID, when you were, you know, doing the cost segregation stuff, obviously you were putting this, this stuff online. So we already established that. Um, but were you like out uh, at events, you know, trying to generate business, that kind of stuff? Are you on like the business development side or are you kind of like uh, more in house kind of doing the actual stuff and just educating people when they ask you questions? Yeah. I'm, I'm a lot on the business development side, although, um, and I love the conferences. It definitely made the, made the rounds in different conferences and events and meetups and stuff like that, local meetups and whatnot. But I found the, you know, the online, it's just so much more beneficial because I work nationally, meaning I don't have any market specifically that I'm yeah. targeting. I can work with anyone anywhere. And therefore the social media just makes it so much easier. But the great thing when you establish yourself through the social media and people get to know you and recognize you as the expert, then when you go and meet people on uh, in person, go to these events, it's, it's just, it's incredible. I mean, literally like it's, it's funny to me because I couldn't even imagine this beforehand, but like, I'm like a celebrity sometimes when I go to these events, Yeah, it's crazy, but it's funny at the same time. So I get, um, you know, and I stand out, obviously I'm an Orthodox, you know, Hasidic Jew and I, you know, wear a long coat and uh, have these side locks. So I stand out. People you got a better beard than me. That's for sure. Okay. It's been growing for a lot of years, but, <laughs> yeah. um, but, yeah. but so I stand out anyways, but right. people recognize me like everywhere. Like I'll go like, Oh, it's, you know, you know I mean, like stopping me to like take selfies with me. It's like, it's, it's funny. <laughs> yeah. It's really funny. Like random people. And, and it's hard for me to, uh, you know, I have a really good memory. Uh, that's an advantage that I have. And so I'll meet people, but random people, right? Because, you know, on LinkedIn, people are just, you know, they call it lurking, right? Just yeah. they're consuming content. They're not necessarily engaging with you. You don't necessarily know who they are, but they know who you are. Right. And so when, when you go into an event and like you're walking through the halls and someone stops you and like, oh, I love your content on LinkedIn. I'm like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Thank you. I, yeah. I don't really know you, but um, it, it's great to already have that established presence. And I think that's the real value of it. So it's a combination of the two. Right. Yeah. So I think that like, that is such a great point because that is one thing that I'm excited for when we hit at some point, 
going back to full-time stuff, uh, full-time in-person stuff in more person, frequently. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's what I'm excited about is to, you know, kind of get to that, the Yona level, um, you know, being able <laughs> to be like, no, well, you know, cause I've met people over the last year virtually here in New Jersey and around the country that I would have never, probably never met otherwise. Right. And I think that that's what the virtual world has given, you know, that was the gift that it gave to us last year. And mm -hmm. I think that now being able to, because I think that people that have not been putting content together or putting stuff out there um, over the last year or so, and just relying on, you know, emails and cold calls, I guess. I mean, they're missing the boat, you know what yeah. I mean? And I think that like when they get back, it's going to, because you want people to remember you like from my end, from title insurance, it's all relationships and service. So if they forget about me, that's not good, you know? So like doing a podcast or putting content on LinkedIn or wherever I'm putting it is basically like imperative because you don't want to, like my greatest fear is to get back to an in-person event one day and somebody, one of my clients or somebody that knows me or whatever, be like, oh my God, I didn't even realize you were still in title insurance. I would have been like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's like my greatest fear, but I'm just doing everything I can to avoid that, right? So right. Um, I think that's, I think you're, you're doing what uh, you should be doing. So I want to talk more again. I get tend to get a little bit all over the place with my episodes. So you'll have to forgive me, but um, I do want to go back to the cost segregation thing. So let's say uh, we have somebody listening that wants to start this process. They, like, they want to reach out to you. Obviously that would be the way to the best way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But is there something that like, like what are like the, the steps, I guess, to how they would actually go through that process to make cost segregation work for them? Sure. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's a one-time thing that's done on a property by an owner, right? Per owner. When you buy a property, your depreciation starts a one-time thing. So it's really like a very simple process. Number one, you reach out to me. That's the first right. step. Obviously. And you can do that before you even own a property. If you're under contract, you're looking to buy it. You just want to see. We always run a free estimate, which will tell you ahead of time up front what the potential tax benefits, tax savings are going to be. And so that's something you can get done even before you own a property or whether you just acquired a property or even if you've owned a property for a number of years and never did cost segregation, you can do it now retroactively. Um, so reach out to me. You get that free analysis, that free estimate. You get to see what the numbers are, you see, oh, wow, I could spend a few thousand bucks and, and save a hundred thousand dollars on taxes. Sounds great. Sign me up. Where do I sign? You sign the thing. <laughs> that's it. And we, we that's it. We're you good sign to the go. thing. You send it to the guy. He takes care of it. You're all good. <laughs> and we got, you know, everything's going to be good. Well, <laughs> um, but we have a engineer uh, site visit, which is part of the uh, process. They'll come to the property. They'll be able to see everything in there, take a very detailed survey, you know, pictures, measurements, et cetera, create this very detailed report. It takes about four to six weeks for us on our end to complete that. And that you're good to go. You have that, you apply that to your taxes and, and that's all you need. Is there ever an instance where like, it, it doesn't make a sense to do it? There's a few instances, and I'm glad you brought that up because it's not necessarily for everyone. I, right. It's always, you know, it's good to reach out and have a discussion, but a few cases where this is not a good idea, but I'd say 90% of the time it is, but there are cases where it does not make sense. Number one is if you are uh, holding a property for a very short amount of time, a year or even, two, you know, less than two years, it probably doesn't make sense because yeah. there's something called depreciation recapture tax that you, you know, have on the sale of the property without getting too complicated in this, you know, getting the benefit up front and then paying a tax on it on the back end. If that's in a very short amount of time, the benefit's going to be much less. There's still benefit there, but it's going to be much less. Um, the second case where it may not make sense is if the property is really too small. So too small, meaning on based on the purchase price. So anything under, I would say anything over a half a million dollar purchase price is great. You know, ex excellent benefit. It's well worth the while. And the bigger the property, the better, because the tax savings are really somewhat a per percentage of the purchase price. So if you have a $50 million property and you're getting 20% of that as an upfront tax deduction, yeah. right, that's huge. <laughs> you're talking about, you know, $10, $10 million. I mean, that's, right. that's crazy. But if it's a, if it's a $500,000, you're looking at about a hundred thousand dollar tax benefit. If it's less, it's going to be 
proportionally less. So that's why I say 500,000, that's the second instance. Smaller property may not be worthwhile. The third instance is if you don't have any tax liability. If you're not paying any income tax or don't have any income tax liability, or maybe you're just you not making any money if the property is vacant or, or, you know, or you're not making any money from it, to get extra deductions that you can't use doesn't make sense. Right. So those are really the three um, instances. Or if you're a nonprofit, obviously don't pay the taxes. Yeah, right. It doesn't right. make sense. So what, uh, so if, I mean, I know you mentioned a couple of examples before, but when I'm looking at, if I, if I have multiple properties, is this something that I would have to do specifically for each property or is there some type of like intertwining of properties? It's each property is done separately because each property has its own, um, you know, its own structure, its own depreciation. And so the, the deductions are going to be applied to each property accordingly, unless they're bought as a portfolio and kind of like as one unit then you could uh, kind of combine them and cross, uh, cross over there. But yeah, it's something done on, on each individual property. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So um, I was just curious. I don't know why that jumped into my head now, uh, like to talk about cost segregation again, um, but we're peppering it through this episode. So hopefully, yeah, you know, as we kind of progress, people are like, oh, let's learn about Yona. Let's learn about cost segregation, all that kind of stuff. Um, so one of the things that I, I wanted to go back to the podcast now, again, Sorry, but um, go back to the podcast. So when you're ta- having these conversations with people, um, and I think one of the things that maybe at the very outset of this show was something that I was trying to figure out how to like finely tune connecting Mike Ham, the, the coolest guy in title insurance with Mike Ham, the host of the Morning Spotlight. So what are some, and I know that you put content out on LinkedIn that is specifically geared towards cost, uh, cost segregation which obviously, boom, there it is. Mm -hmm. Um, But is there a way that you're able to take uh, what you're doing, like having someone like me on the podcast or having somebody like, I've seen you have uh, other guests that I've also had on like Stephanie Saunders and some other people that, you know, are other, you know, different parts of the real estate industry that don't necessarily focus uh, or don't, not necessarily, but don't focus on cost segregation. So how are you able to kind of marry Yona, the podcast host with Weiss advice and Yona, the cost segregation expert? I think like you said before, it's really about getting to know you as a person. And that's why people are going to listen to the podcast. That's why people are going to follow you. Yes, you are the cost seg guy, right? Yes, you're the coolest guy in title insurance. If your branding is done well, okay, and people every time they see your name and every time they see any content you put out, they're going to see you're the cost say guy, right? You're the cost segregation expert. Then it doesn't matter what type of content you put out there. Okay. It doesn't matter if you're putting out content. And and to be honest, probably about 10% or so of the actual content I post is about cost segregation. Yeah. Okay. The vast majority of, you know, and I'm posting multiple times a day, you know, and so the vast majority of that is, is other stuff. It's totally unrelated. It's the podcast or it's my meetup or it's just other real estate stuff, or it's just other random, you know, LinkedIn stuff or marketing or whatever it is. But every time someone sees you, that just, that branding gets in their head. And so that's why it's funny. People like, oh, I love all the information, all the content you put out there about cost segregation, but I don't. Yeah. I don't put a lot of information, but again, it's just that branding. They, they see your name, they recognize who you are, what you do. And that's really what it's all about. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I mean, I totally agree with that. And like, you never know, at least in my opinion, you never know as you build up like this network, if you do 111 episodes over the course of about a year um, or less than a year, I guess, who knows like who's going to be like, Oh my God. Yeah. Cost, I, I could use that for this person over exactly. here. So you never know who that next deal or that next business opportunity is going to come from. So talking to as many people as possible has never hurt anybody. You know what I mean? Exactly. So I think that's just such a great point. Um, so I, I just, as a curiosity, out of curiosity, I know now I know Yona, the podcast host, I know Yona, the cost segregation guy, What's Yona do like outside of all this stuff? You know, like what are, what are your hobbies? Do you have hobbies or well, are you just I'm, constantly doing this? <laughs> yeah, well, I do. I do a lot of this. Um, I have six kids. So okay. that's, um, that's, that's kind of my, <laughs> 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 my hobbies, you know, have a lot to do with spending time with them, whatever they're doing. Right. Um, I, you know, if I had to be honest, like I really just enjoy doing that. I enjoy, um, studying, you know, just learning uh, scriptures and, you know, Jewish texts. That's something I, I really enjoy uh, that something I do every day anyways. And I like hiking, you know, okay. when I get to do it, uh, it's yep. not often, but I like to go out and take the kids, uh, just go up in mountains somewhere, whatever, just 
in New Jersey, outdoors. right? In Jersey, anywhere, the, anywhere, yeah, anywhere. Okay. Do you have like a yeah. like a go to spot, like one of your favorite spots? No, not really. No, because no. we're big <laughs> we're not, big hikers awesome ourselves. Enough. Yeah, we like to hike. It's not awesome so enough. yeah, we'll go up to like Mount Tammany or uh, Stairway to Heaven, like all those places up in northern New Jersey. Those places are cool. So if you haven't been, go check those okay. out. They're a little tough. Yeah. I didn't have hiking boots, so it was a little bit harder to get up the mountain, but, um, you know, whatever. So, all right, let me talk about, I always like asking people like yourself and like every other guest that I have on here about goals. So I'm interested to hear maybe your first goals for the podcast. Uh, so what are, I mean, you've obviously enjoy it. Um, you obviously spend a lot of time on it. So obviously it's something that's very important to you. So maybe looking mm-hmm. out over the next, the course of the next year or so, uh, what are some things that you're you know, hoping to accomplish with the podcast. I love the podcast and I think you hit the nail on the head. If you don't really enjoy it, you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Right. That's, that's for sure. Um, you know, my goal is really just to have, just continue building those relationships through each and every guest that I have. And right. that's really the goal. So it's not really, I don't have like a, a big goal. I think if I, if I want to put it kind of in perspective of some, another goal that I have, I would like to somehow combine this, which is I'm uh, going to be focusing a lot this year uh, on, you know, getting transitioning into more actively investing in, uh, in real estate. Okay. Um, so that's something myself personally. Yeah. Um, so I've invested before and I've done some passive investing and stuff like that, but I'm, I'm trying to, I'd like to transition into that, finding the right you know, partners and the right, so having the podcast and having established that audience, I'd like to somehow kind of incorporate that into it and yeah. make that transition and kind of help that to grow that side of the business. Okay. Well, you know, you've made a ton of contacts in a lot of different areas, like you said, of the real right. estate industry. So I'm sure that uh, that can only help. And if you need the coolest guy in title insurance, obviously, you know who to call, but um, you know, I'm, I'm sure other people that you work with may not want that. So um, <laughs> what about uh, from a business standpoint, uh, do you have goals that you set for yourself uh, you know, over the course of the next year or so for business related uh, items? Um, again, it's really, I mean, like I said, that one, that goal of mine acquiring like a, a big multifamily property. That's yeah. A big, that's a big goal of mine this year. Um, but from like, like the, the yeah, cost the segregation cost, side yeah, of yeah. it, yeah. Cost segregation. I just have fun with it. I, yeah. I literally do. I just enjoy what I do. I just have fun with it. Um, you know, I, it's always good to just continue building it and, and being better and better and better and having more and more and more. Yeah. Um, I think a, a big goal of mine, which I've been working on for a few months already, uh, is to be a lot more organized with it so that I can, you know, thank God there's a huge influx of clients and to be able to service everyone. Unfortunately, to be honest, like I have a very, very good memory, but I don't work well with CRMs and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah. a lot of it's just kind of in my head and, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and that's difficult and it's hard to work. You have assistance and, and people to help me with that. If a lot of it's just in my head. So one of my goals is kind of transfer a lot of that over to some, uh, assistance so that I can continue growing that. Awesome. Okay. So, um, I did mention we were going to do a closing segment, but as we were going through this episode, I decided I was going to add in a segment, which I've never done before because it only fits for you. So okay. we're going to do this. So we're going to do a, the segment is going to be called Weiss advice. Um, right. so, uh, we need some advice because most of the people that listen to this show, uh, are between the ages of 25 and 35. They live in the Northeast. They're either entrepreneurs or real estate investors or somebody in, like, interested in getting involved in real estate. So I'd like to look at maybe a couple different, um, things, maybe like an aspiring real estate investor. What would be one piece of advice you would give that, that person? The best piece of advice is, is going to be. Uh, and I'll split it into two because they're kind of combined one yeah. to another is continue learning, right? Just, just learn as much as you can consume as much information. And the second thing, which goes along with that is find those people who you want to be like in a certain aspect. And right. you want to like, Oh, I see that person owns X amount of property or that person has been doing this for X amount of years, whatever is successful. And and connect with them, get to know them, 
apprentice them if you can like go and and ask them if you can work for them for free or you know just partner with them see if you can add value and so the the combination of the two is learning and apprenticing is uh, those two things or that's where you're going to get go far do you have like a mentor multiple mentors was that something you actively seeked out when you were uh when you were starting out yeah absolutely multiple mentors same yeah i think i have like about three to five that i usually are like my go-to people whenever i have a question call them because they know what they're doing and i'm mm-hmm. like making it up as i go so um next wise advice is uh as a podcaster what is one piece of advice you would give a aspiring podcaster not necessarily a real estate podcaster or a real estate person just a podcaster in general mm-hmm. grow your audience on social media because right. that's where you're gonna get the biggest um you know the biggest subscribers to your podcast you don't get a lot of uh, organic listeners or subscribers on the podcasting platforms themselves. Right. You can, I mean, you may, might get some, but where you're going to really get a lot of it is from uh, social media. So if you have a, if you don't have a following yet, or you're not posting content uh, and doing that successfully, do that, put a lot of time into that. And I would say, put a lot of time into that even before you start and launch a podcast and kind of use the social media to build up the launch of your podcast so that you can, you know, you already have an existing listener base before you even launch. Right. I totally agree with that. And that's a perfect segue because the last piece of Weiss Weiss advice is because you are a content creator, what would be one piece of advice that you would give, whether they're on the real estate end or the podcast end, one piece of advice, if they're, if they think that they want to start creating content, which Mm -hmm. I think you and I would both agree that they should be, um, what would be your maybe one tip to actually uh, get them started because a lot of people just have no idea what they should be posting on right. social media. I mean, sometimes I don't know. I just kind of like throw something up and be like, maybe this will work, you know? So uh, what, what would be one tip for that? So I'll give two tips just cause I just kind of yeah. want to. Um, two tips is cool. I'll, I'll allow <laughs> one, it. <laughs> one, one tip is, is very, very much related to what I just said before, which is kind of share what's happening share your journey, share whatever is going on in your life. And if it's related to business, even better, uh, share that. And so that's content. Everyone has content because we have stuff that's going on in our life. And even as it's just asking questions, you get, you know, it's, it's about creating um, engagement, creating community, creating relationships with people. And so that's what social media is not about. It's not about posting content, right? Because right? you can do that and no one will see it. Yeah. Okay. But if you create, create engaging content, which has to do with creating those relationships in that community, that's where, you know, whatever content you create, doesn't matter what it is, that's where it's going to be beneficial. And the second thing I'll say to that is kind of a, a good way to do that is to not actually create your own original content, but is actually to start off uh, by engaging with other people's content and kind of observing number one, what, what create what makes good content, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm right. engaging with others. And also you're adding value to them uh, simultaneously. And you get ideas through sometimes your own comments. Like I've, I've had um, comments that I've turned into posts themselves because I'm like, this is a great, you know, piece of content, right? Just yeah. this conversation through this, you know, this uh, comment that I wrote over here, I'm just going to, you know, copy that and, and turn that into a post. Yeah. I think it's, it's called social media for a reason, right? I think you said that earlier. It's called social media for a reason. So you have to be social, whether it's creating right. a community or a, a following or whatever it is. Um, you know, I think that that is great wise advice. So that was, uh, that just kind of came to my head. I'm, I'm impressing yeah. myself on that. Um, <laughs> well done, so, yeah, right, right. Out of the blue. Um, do you, so I don't know why I just thought of this question too. Do you think of yourself as an influencer? Um, I see myself as one, I don't know, so I think of myself as one, but right. I, I just see the, I see what's, you know, what happens. I, I just see the reality of it. And, yeah. and so I've kind of accepted that, <laughs> that, right. um, and it, it is humbling, but a real leader, whatever regard that is, hopefully it's for the good. You know, you have to kind of accept that and, and be an, you know, influence people for good. And I, I believe I'm, I'm trying to do that positively. I agree. Yeah. No, I think you're doing a great job. And that's why I definitely wanted to have you on the show. So uh, we've been talking for, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes, something like that. Uh, kind of lost track there for a minute, but um, we're going to move the show into, <clears throat> excuse me, um, our closing segment, which we call under the spotlight. So uh, the spotlighters, which is what I call my audience. Uh, there's my community um, have listened to Mike Ham and Yona Weiss talk for the last 
45 minutes, 50 minutes, like I said. Um, we've obviously covered a lot of different stuff from the cost segregation side, creating content, uh, podcasting. We did the little new Weiss advice section uh, with Yona Weiss, um, which we will never do again, I promise. So don't worry <laughs> about that. Um, <laughs> but uh, what would be one thing that you want the spotlighters to walk away from this episode with? I'd say the one thing is, um, you know, believe in yourself. Like that's it. You know, whether it comes to whatever business you're doing, whether it's social media, engaging, if you're starting a podcast, it doesn't matter what you're doing, what you want to do. Just, you, you just have to go with it. You have to believe that, be behind it. If you don't believe in yourself and what you're doing, then you, you can't be successful. So, right. you know, what, as, as hard as that is for some people, that's really the key to success is really the, the mindset of I'm going to do this and I'm going to put all my effort into this and do it with the best mind, you know, from the get go. Right. Was that something that, again, this is our last point of the day, but was that something <laughs> that you struggled with when you first started putting your content out, like believing in yourself and believing that you could put stuff out online that people were actually going to consume or did you just like go for it and whatever? You know, at first I was very hesitant and, and, but I figured what do I have to lose? Right. Yeah. And, and since I didn't have any really like fear of, of that, I mean, there was, a, there is a fear everyone has of like, well, what are people going to think uh, of me? But, you know, when you notice like just being yourself is people that are attracted to you, people that, you know, relate to you are going to like what you have to say. And, yeah. and that's just a reality. So, and the people that the more, don't, don't matter. Exactly. You know? So exactly. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to cut you off there, but no, um, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so where can the spotlighters get more Yona? The best way to find me is on LinkedIn. That's awesome. definitely the best place to find me. You can obviously yep. go to yonaweiss.com or uh, follow the Weiss Advice Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Absolutely, and we will make sure that we put the LinkedIn, the website, and the uh, links to the podcast in the show notes um, so you can go listen to get more Yona uh, because obviously he is tremendous um, and a great source of information, a uh, great personality uh, shows great. Hopefully uh, when my episode pops, people go listen to that too. Um, so Yona, again, thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Absolutely. And everybody else, thanks for listening and we will catch you next time. <laughs>